Chapter 30 Ascent of Vesuvius Continued See Naples and die. Well, I do not know that one would necessarily die after merely seeing it, but to attempt to live there might turn out a little differently. To see Naples as we saw it in the early dawn from far up on the side of Vesuvius is to see a picture of wonderful beauty. At that distance, its dingy buildings looked white, and so, rank on rank of balconies, windows, and roofs, they piled themselves up from the blue ocean till the colossal castle of St. Elmo topped the grand white pyramid and gave the picture symmetry, emphasis, and completeness. And when its lilies turned to roses, when it blushed under the sun's first kiss, it was beautiful beyond all description. One might well say, then, see Naples and die. The frame of the picture was charming. In front, the smooth sea, a vast mosaic of many colors, the lofty islands swimming in a dreamy haze in the distance. At our end of the city, the stately double peak of Vesuvius and its strong black ribs and seams of lava stretching down to the limitless level Campania. A green carpet that enchants the eye leads it on and on past clusters of trees and isolated houses and snowy villages until it shreds out in the fringe of mist and general vagueness far away. It is from the Hermitage, there on the side of Vesuvius, that one should see Naples and die. But do not go within the walls and look at it in detail. This, that takes away some of the romance of the thing. The people are filthy in their habits, and this makes filthy streets and breeds disagreeable sights and smells. There never was a community so prejudiced against the cholera as these Neapolitans are. But they have good reason to be. The cholera generally vanquishes a Neapolitan when it seizes him. Because you understand, before the doctor can dig through the dirt and get at the disease, the man dies. The upper classes take a sea bath every day and are pretty decent. The streets are generally about wide enough for one wagon. How they do swarm with people. It is Broadway repeated in every street, in every court, in every alley. Such masses, such throngs, such multitudes of hurrying, bustling, struggling humanity. We never saw the like of it, hardly even in New York, I think. There are seldom any sidewalks, and when there are, they're not often wide enough to pass a man on without caroming on him. So everybody walks in the street, and where the street is wide enough, carriages are forever dashing along. Why a thousand people are not run over and crippled every day is a mystery that no man can solve. But if there is an eighth wonder in the world, it must be the dwelling houses of Naples. I honestly believe a good majority of them are a hundred feet high, and the solid brick walls are seven feet through. You go up nine flights of stairs before you get to the first floor. No, not nine, but there or thereabouts. It's a little bird cage of an iron railing in front of every window, clear away up, up, up among the eternal clouds, where the roof is, and there is always somebody looking out of every window, people of ordinary size looking out from the first floor, people a shade smaller from the second. People that look a little smaller yet from the third, and from thence upward, they grow smaller and smaller by a regularly graduated diminution, till the folks in the topmost windows seem more like birds in an uncommonly tall martin box than anything else. The perspective of one of these narrow cracks of streets, with its rows of tall houses, stretching away till they come together in the distance like railroad tracks, its clotheslines crossing over at all altitudes and 
waving their bannered raggedness over the swarms of people below and the white-dressed women perched in balcony railings all the way from the pavement up to the heavens a perspective like that is really worth going into neapolitan details to see ascent of vesuvius continued Naples, with its immediate suburb, contains 625,000 inhabitants, but I am satisfied it covers no more ground than an American city of 150,000. It reaches up into the air infinitely higher than three American cities. And there is where the secret of it lies. I will observe here in passing that the contrast between the opulence and poverty and magnificence and misery are more frequent and more striking in Naples than in Paris even. One must go to the Bois de Balloons to see fashionable dressing, splendid equipages and stunning liveries, and to the Faubourg St. Antoine to see vice, misery, hunger, rags, dirt. But in the thoroughfares of Naples, these things are all mixed together. Naked boys of nine years and the fancy-dressed children of luxury. Shreds and tatters and brilliant uniforms. Jackass carts and state carriages. Beggars, princes and bishops jostle each other in every street. At six o'clock every evening, all Naples turns out to drive on the River de Chigia whatever that may mean. And for two hours one may stand there and see the motliest and the worst mixed procession go by that ever eyes beheld. Princes. There are more princes than policemen in Naples. The city is infested with them. Princes who live up seven flights of stairs and don't own any principalities. We'll keep a carriage and go hungry, and clerks and mechanics and milliners and strumpets will go without their dinners and squander the money on a hack ride in the chiaja. And the ragtag and the rubbish of the city stack themselves up to the number of twenty or thirty on a rickety little go-cart hauled by a donkey not much bigger than a cat. And they drive in the chiaja, dukes and bankers, in sumptuous carriages and with gorgeous drivers and footmen turn out also and so the furious procession goes for two hours rank and wealth and obscurity and poverty clatter along side by side in the wild procession and then go home serene happy covered with glory I was looking at the magnificent marble staircase in the king's palace the other day, which it was said cost five million francs, and I suppose it did cost half a million. Maybe. I felt as if it must be a fine thing to live in a country where there was such comfort and such luxury as this, and then I stepped out musing and almost walked over a vagabond, who was eating his dinner on the curbstone, a piece of bread and a bunch of grapes. When I found this Mustang was clerking in a fruit establishment, he had the establishment along with him in a basket, the two cents a day, that he had no palace at home where he lived. I lost some of my enthusiasm concerning the happiness of living in Italy. This naturally suggests to me a thought about wages here. Lieutenants in the army get about a dollar a day and the common soldiers a couple of cents. I only know one clerk. He gets four dollars a month. Printers get six dollars and a half a month. But I have heard of a foreman who gets thirteen. To be growing suddenly and violently rich as this man is, naturally makes him a bloated aristocrat. The airs he puts on are insufferable. And speaking of wages, reminds me of prices of merchandise. 
In Paris, you pay twelve dollars a dozen for Jovine's best kid gloves. Gloves of about as good a quality sell here at three or four dollars a dozen. You pay five or six dollars a piece for fine linen shirts in Paris. Here and in Leghorn, you pay two and a half. In Marseilles, you pay forty dollars for a first-class dress coat made by a good tailor. But in Leghorn, you can get a full-dress suit for the same money. Here you get a handsome business suits at from ten to twenty dollars, and in Leghorn you can get an overcoat for fifteen dollars that would cost you seventy in New York. Fine kid boots are worth eight dollars in Marseilles and four dollars here. Lions velvets rank higher in America than those of Genoa, yet the bulk of Lions velvets you buy in the States are made in Genoa and imported into Lyons, where they receive the Lyons stamp, and are then exported to America. You can buy enough velvet in Genoa for $25 to make a $500 cloak in New York, so the ladies tell me. Of course, these things bring me back by a natural and easy transition to the ascent of Vesuvius continued. And thus, the wonderful Blue Grotto is suggested to me. It is situated on the island of Capri, 22 miles from Naples. We chartered a little steamer and went out there. Of course, the police boarded us and put us through a health examination and inquired into our politics. Before they would let us land... The, the airs these little insect governments put on are in the last degree ridiculous. They even put a policeman on board of our boat to keep an eye on us as long as we were in the Capri Dominions. They thought we wanted to steal the grotto, I suppose. It was worth stealing. The entrance to the cave is four feet high and four feet wide and is in the face of a lofty perpendicular cliff, the sea wall. You enter in small boats, and a tight squeeze it is, too. You cannot go in at all when the tide is up. Once within, you find yourself in an arched cavern about 160 feet long, 120 feet wide, and about 70 high. How deep it is, no man knows. It goes down to the bottom of the ocean. The waters of this placid subterranean lake are the brightest, loveliest blue that can be imagined. They are as transparent as plate glass, and are coloring with shame the richest sky that ever bent over Italy. No tint could be made more ravishing, no luster more superb. Throw a stone in the water, and the myriad of tiny bubbles that are created flash out a brilliant glare like blue theatrical fires. Dip an oar, and its blade turns to splendid frosted silver tinted with blue. Let a man jump in, and instantly he is cased in an armor more gorgeous than ever kingly crusader wore. Then we went to Ischia, but I had already been to that island and tired myself to death, resting a couple of days and studying human villainy with the landlord of the Grande Sentinelle for a model. So we went to Procidia, and thence to Pizzuli, where St. Paul landed after he sailed from Samos. I landed at precisely the same spot where St. Paul landed, and so did Dan and the others. It was a remarkable coincidence. St. Paul preached to these people seven days before he started to Rome. Nero's baths, the ruins of Bahi, the temple of Serapis, Cumai, where the Cumen Sibyl interpreted the oracles, the lake Agnano, with its ancient submerged city, still visible far down in its depths. These and a hundred other points of interest we examined with critical imbecility, but the Grotto of the Dog claimed our chief attention, because we heard and read so much about it. 
everybody who has written about the Grotto del Cane and its poisonous vapors from Pliny down to Smith, and every tourist has held a dog over its floor by the legs to test the capabilities of the place. The dog dies in a minute and a half, and a chicken instantly. As a general thing, strangers who crawl in there to sleep do not get up until they are called. And then they don't either. The stranger that ventures to sleep there takes a permanent contract. I longed to see this grotto. I resolved to take a dog and hold him myself, suffocate him a little, and time him, suffocate him some more, and then finish him. We reached the grotto at about three in the afternoon and proceeded at once to make the experiments, but now an important difficulty presented itself. We had no dog. The scent of Vesuvius continued. <laughs> At the Hermitage, we were about fifteen or eighteen hundred feet above the sea, and thus, thus far a portion of the ascent had been pretty abrupt. For the next two miles the road was a mixture. Sometimes the ascent was abrupt, and sometimes it was not, but one characteristic it possessed all the time was without failure, without modification. It was all uncompromisingly and unspeakably infamous. It was a rough, narrow trail and led over an old lava flow, a black ocean which was tumbled into a thousand fantastic shapes, a wild chaos of ruin, desolation, and barrenness, a wilderness of billowy upheavals, of furious whirlpools of miniature mountains rent asunder, of gnarled and knotted, wrinkled and twisted masses of blackness that mimicked branching roots, great vines, trunks of trees all interlaced and mingled together, and all these weird shapes, all these turbulent panorama, all this stormy, far-stretching waste of blackness with its thrilling suggestiveness of life, of action, of boiling, surging, furious motion was petrified, all stricken dead and cold in the instant of its maddest rioting, fettered, paralyzed, and left to glower at heaven in impotent rage forevermore. Finally we stood in a level, narrow valley, a valley that had been created by the terrific march of some old-time eruption, and on either hand towered the two steep peaks of Vesuvius. The one we had to climb, the one that contains the active volcano, seemed about 800 or 1,000 feet high and looked almost too straight up and down for any man to climb, and certainly no mule could climb it with a man on his back. Four of these native pirates will carry you to the top in a sedan chair if you wish it. But suppose they were to slip and let you fall, is it likely you would ever stop rolling? Not this side of eternity, perhaps. We left the mules, sharpened our fingernails, and began the ascent. I've been riding about so long, at twenty minutes to six in the morning, the path led straight up a rugged sweep of loose chunks of pumice stone, and for about every two steps forward we took, we slid back one. It was so excessively steep that we had to stop every fifty or sixty steps and rest a moment. To see our comrades, we had to look very nearly straight up at those above us and very nearly straight down at those below. We stood on the summit at last. It had taken an hour and fifteen minutes to make the trip. What we saw there was simply a circular crater, a circular ditch, if you please, about two hundred feet deep and four or five hundred feet wide, whose inner wall was about half a mile in circumference. In the center of the great circus ring thus formed was a torn and ragged upheaval of a hundred feet high, all snowed over with a sulfur crust of many and many a brilliant and beautiful color, and the ditch enclosed this like the moat of a castle, or surrounded it as a little river does, a little island. 
if the simile is better. The sulfur coating of that island was gaudy in the extreme, all mingled together in the richest confusion were red, blue, brown, black, yellow, white. I do not know that there was a color or shade of color or combination of colors unrepresented. And when the sun burst through the morning mists and fired this tinted magnificence, it topped imperial Vesuvius like a jeweled crown. The crater itself, the ditch was not so variegated in coloring, but yet in its softness, richness, and unpretentious elegance, it was more charming, more fascinating to the eye. There was nothing loud about its well-bred and well-creased look beautiful. One could stand and look down upon it for a week without getting tired of it. It had the semblance of a pleasant meadow whose slender grasses and whose velvety mosses were frosted with a shining dust and tinted with palest green that deepened gradually to the darkest hue of the orange leaf and deepened yet again into the gravest brown then faded into orange, and then in the brightest gold, and culminated in the delicate pink of a new-blown rose, where portions of the meadow had sunk, and where other portions had been broken up like an ice floe, the cavernous openings of the one and the ragged upturned edges exposed by the others were hung with a lacework of soft tinted crystals of sulphur that changed their deformities into quaint shapes and figures that were full of grace and beauty. The walls of the ditch were brilliant with yellow banks of sulfur, and the lava and pumice stone of many colors. No fire was visible anywhere, but gusts of sulfurous steam issued silently and invisibly from a thousand little cracks and fissures in the crater and were wafted up to our noses with every breeze. But so long as we kept our nostrils buried in our handkerchiefs, there was small danger of suffocation. Some of the boys thrust long slips of paper down into holes and set them on fire, and so achieved the glory of lighting their cigars by the flames of Vesuvius. And others cooked eggs over fissures in the rocks, and were happy. The view from the summit would have been superb but for the fact that the sun could only pierce the mists at long intervals. Thus the glimpses we had of the grand panorama below were only fitful and unsatisfactory. The Descent The descent of the mountain was a labor of only four minutes. Instead of stalking down the rugged path we ascended, we chose one which was bedded knee-deep in loose ashes and plowed our way with prodigious strides that would have almost have shamed the performance of him with the seven-league boots. The Vesuvius of today is a very poor affair compared with the mighty volcano of Kilauea in the Sandwich Islands, but I'm glad I visited it. It was well worth it. It is said that during one of the grand eruptions of Vesuvius, it discharged massy rocks weighing many tons a thousand feet into the air. Its vast jets of smoke and steam ascended thirty miles towards the firmament, and clouds of its ashes were wafted abroad and fell upon the decks of ships seven hundred and fifty miles at sea. I will take the ashes at a moderate discount, if anyone will take the thirty miles of smoke. But I do not feel able to take a commanding interest in the whole story by myself.